Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Conti. I'm the director of the Center for Media Innovation at Point Park University, which is a laboratory for the future of storytelling right here in the center of downtown Pittsburgh. And so when the organizers of this event, I think when they were thinking about where I might fit on the program, uh, they thought about innovation and equated that with technology and realized that I was probably in a uniquely situated place to talk about technology. As a former journalist, we've seen technology has been amazing for journalists. On one hand, journalists are able to do reporting like they never could before. They're able to connect with uh, the readers and viewers like never before. They're able to do these amazing things. But on the other hand, we've seen technology erode uh, the journalism industry and uh, change the entire way that news organizations are funded. And so when we started thinking about what would this panel look like, a discussion of technology and the First Amendment, it was really important to me to look at it from the perspective of how has technology, on one hand, enhanced our freedoms of the First Amendment? You know, how has it given us more freedoms and given us more liberties? But on the other hand, how has it also threatened them? And so we're going to open up this afternoon with a discussion from someone who is uniquely situated to discuss this. Uh, Trevor Tim is the co-founder and executive director of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. It's a San Francisco nonprofit that advocates for uh, journalists and whistleblowers with a real focus on how technology fits in and facilitates that discussion and that relationship. He's a, uh, he describes himself as a, a journalist, an activist, and a lawyer in that order. Uh, his work has appeared in the New York Times, uh, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, the Harvard uh, Law and Policy Review Journal, a lot of places. And uh, in terms of today's discussion, uh, he worked on a book about uh, the Pentagon Papers and the First Amendment. Please join me in welcoming Trevor Tim to Pittsburgh. Thank you so much, and thank you to Heinz Endowments and the Pittsburgh Foundation for putting on this uh, wonderful event. Uh, so I have a slide here, there we go. Um, so Freedom of the Press Foundation is a nonprofit that tries to protect journalism in the 21st century. And a big way we do that is by building technology to help journalists and sources communicate securely. And in other cases, try to call attention to the harm that other types of technology uh, can, um, and how, how that harm or how that technology can hurt journalists. Um, so there's both a lot of promise when it comes to technology in the First Amendment, um, whether we're talking about journalists or activists, protesters or everyday internet users, um, but there's also a lot of peril. And uh, so I wanna start by talking uh, about uh, journalists specifically, since that's what I deal with every day. Uh, but first to understand um, how technology impacts journalists, we have to understand one of the uh, most important moments in legal history when it comes to American journalism. And that happened decades before uh, smartphones and the internet existed. Uh, so in 1971, uh, the Supreme Court decided Brandsburg v. Hayes, um, or what is known as the reporter's privilege case. I'm sure many in the room are familiar with it. It was during the Nixon administration when the federal government was subpoenaing journalists at an alarming rate, uh, basically demanding that they testify against their sources in court. Um, now, anybody familiar with the practice of journalism knows that protecting sources and providing them confidentiality is a critical undertaking. You can't do your job without it. Um, so journalists were asking the Supreme Court to recognize that they had a similar right that doctors and lawyers and therapists have, uh, that they can refuse to testify in all but extreme cases. Uh, but so in a uh, rather controversial and divided opinion, uh, the court ruled, at least in the cases before it, that journalists actually did not have that right under the First Amendment. It was an awful ruling for press freedom, and it could have proved an existential crisis. Uh, but then journalists did what uh, many may not have expected them to do, since they're often portrayed themselves as objective and unbiased and not wanting to insert their own opinion uh, into issues they report on. But they banded together after the ruling and decided to resist. Uh, they would refuse 
to testify, even if served with a subpoena, even if they faced going to jail. And that's actually what happened. So this is a, a New York Times reporter, uh, Myron Farber, from um, uh, the 1980s. He actually went to jail for several weeks uh, to protect a source. And what happened in a lot of these cases was that uh, states responded by passing laws, shield laws, that could provide many of the same protections that reporters were asking for in the Supreme Court. Uh, courts also, appeals courts also followed suit and found a limited privilege in many of these cases. Um, so it ended up being one of the most successful civil disobedience campaigns since the civil rights era. Uh, there wasn't a federal shield law, so these laws did not apply to the federal government. But what the federal government found out was that they did not want a long drawn out legal battle where it was on the front page of the newspaper every day that they were thinking of throwing a journalist in jail. And so this is a, a huge reason why there were um, hardly any federal cases involving the prosecution of journalist sources uh, for the second half of the, 21st, or the 20th century. Um, from the Nixon administration to the second Bush administration, there were uh, really only two cases that were successfully prosecuted involving the source of a journalist. Unfortunately, uh, that all changed about a decade ago with the advent of smartphones and the internet. During the Obama administration, these numbers ballooned. Uh, eight or nine people, depending on how you count, were actually prosecuted for leaking to the press during the Obama administration. And that was more than all other administrations combined. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen those numbers get even worse uh, during the Trump administration. And <clears throat> uh, so why has this really occurred? Uh, there are many reasons for this shift. Um, you know, obviously the, the Trump administration has a visceral hatred for the media, but the Obama administration had promised to be the most transparent administration in history. Uh, so th there's one issue that really sticks, sticks out, and that's technology. About 10 years ago, at the end of the Bush administration, the government figured out that it was actually much easier to prosecute sources now. Now that they had all sorts of surveillance data at their fingertips, which they never had before. And they could get this data without reporters knowing at all. So there is uh, no one who embodies this kind of paradigm shift more than former New York Times reporter James Risen. Uh, Risen won the Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for exposing Bush's illegal warrantless wiretapping program. Uh, he had written a book at the time called State of War, and the Bush administration had subpoenaed him for, uh, to testify against one of his alleged sources at a trial. And when the Obama administration took office, they continued up the legal fight. Um, he was under the subpoena for seven years. Um, he after he exhausted all of his legal options, appealing all the way up to the Supreme Court, he was basically resigned to go to prison uh, instead of testify. Uh, but then something interesting happened. On the eve of the trial, the administration suddenly dropped their subpoena. They had been claiming for years that his testimony was critical to the case and they could not bring it without it. Uh, but then all of a sudden they were gonna go ahead uh, without Risen's testimony and, and it seemed like a happy ending. He was spared from going to jail. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case for his source. It turned out that prosecutors had gained access to Risen's phone records, his email records, his bank records, his credit card records, his travel records. This is what he told the New York Times at the time. Uh, he said that I'm not sure what else they could have gotten besides my kids' birth certificates. And so with this information, the prosecutors convinced a jury that um, uh, Rise and Source had broken the law and, that, and he was sent to prison. Um, afterwards, again to the New York Times, an uh, unnamed national security official told a press freedom advocate uh, that the Rise and Subpoena is the last one you'll see. We don't need to ask who you're talking to, we know. Now, you know, you can imagine some might argue, isn't this a good thing? We don't want journalists getting subpoenaed, we don't want them going to jail. Uh, but this was actually a, a very important leverage point that journalists had. 
you know, they have to be able to convince sources to keep uh, them confidential. If they can't protect them, they may not come forward in the first place. But if, journal if, if the government can strip uh, this protection away from journalists without the journalists able to protest, then it's a potentially uh, a much more dangerous situation. Governments can now go to a third party like a Google or an AT&T or a Verizon or a Facebook. They can serve a secret legal order on these companies, gather all of these communications records, and the journalist won't find out until it's too late. They'll have no ability to challenge it in court. They have no ability to refuse. Um, and so we've seen this happen over and over again. Uh, this is another case during the Obama administration. Um, a similarly named reporter from Fox News uh, named James Rosen um, had a secret warrant served on his Gmail account. Uh, the government actually read his, the content of his emails uh, in a uh, leak case uh, involving a State Department official. Uh, they even went as far as to call him, a, in court documents, a co-conspirator, um, potentially violating the Espionage Act. Um, this also happened uh, to the Associated Press. Uh, the Associated Press uh, had 20 of their phone lines subpoenaed, um, which uh, may have affected as many as 100 journalists. And this, was in, this involved one leak case, uh, but it could have exposed countless other sources uh, at the same time. So at least one person, when this was all happening, uh, was paying attention. Uh, Edward Snowden. Um, he had uh, been watching uh, how these leak cases had been unfolded, and um, Snowden was lucky in the sense that he was actually a, a digital security expert himself. Uh, he knew this long digital trail of data uh, can often lead back to people, and so when he contacted Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras uh, to come forward about NSA surveillance, uh, he did so insisting that they use encryption. Uh, he used an anonymous email address, and actually there is a famous story about how Glenn Greenwald almost lost the story of the century because he refused to set up email encryption at the time. And you know, to be fair, in, 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 even in 2013, almost nobody was using digital security tools. Um, Laura Poitras was actually one of the very, very few journalists who was. She was involved um, in another surveillance um, controversy when she was uh, stopped at the border uh, almost 40 times uh, and interrogated for uh, a movie that she made about the Iraq War in 2005 that was actually nominated for an Oscar. Um, and so Snowden really showed the world uh, that using technology to actually protect yourself against the technology that governments can use can be incredibly important. He ended up coming forward, but the gauntlet was essentially laid down, and news organizations started paying more attention to this. So uh, around the same time, a few months later, um, our organization, Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, launched a project called SecureDrop. And what SecureDrop is is essentially a whistleblower submission system. Uh, news organizations can install SecureDrop, uh, and uh, on their website, sources can visit um, a particular news organization, SecureDrop, and send them tips or documents in hopefully a much more anonymous and secure way uh, than phone calls or emails. And it, you know, SecureDrop tries to use cutting-edge technology, but actually what it's, what it's really trying to do is put the power back in reporters' hands. Um, we cannot stop uh, the government from issuing subpoenas um, for journalist information or for them to testify. But what we can do is eliminate all of these third parties um, that have our data. Um, so with SecureDrop, we develop the software, uh, but when news organizations install it, it's on a server that sits on their property. And the source and the journalist only communicate through the server. And so the only individual that has access to any of this information is the news organization itself. So if they receive a subpoena directly, they can refuse to comply. They can challenge it in court. They can try to narrow it. Um, but us as Freedom of the Press Foundation are totally locked out uh, once it's installed. Um, and so uh, we launched this in 2013 um, on the one-year anniversary of 
the Snowden revelations, The Guardian and The Washington Post installed it. Um, shortly after that, many other news organizations started doing the same. Um, and actually, uh, at uh, around election time last year, um, actually um, uh, just a week after the New York Times uh, launched Secure Drop, uh, along with a secure tips page with, which gives uh, sources a variety of options for contacting them in, in more secure ways uh, than email or phone calls. And so really the, 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 the shift among journalists started with Snowden, but it really exploded when uh, Donald Trump was elected president. He you know, disparages the media on an almost daily basis, talking about how they are the enemy of the American people, how he wants to sue news organizations uh, when they write bad stories about him. Uh, I actually counted the number of times he threatened to sue a news organization uh, just during the campaign, and it was uh, over 14 times. Um, and so there have been many stories since that these are the types of tools news organizations are starting to use uh, to hold the Trump administration accountable. Um, another one of those tools is Signal. Signal is an application anybody can download on their phone very easily. Um, it's an, an encrypted messaging app. Uh, it essentially uh, means that only the sender and the receiver of the message can read that message. Uh, Signal itself is locked out of, of reading that message as well. And so it's become a go-to go -to tool for not just journalists, but activists and even political campaigns after uh, the, Clintons, uh, the Clinton campaign's emails were hacked. Uh, their campaign uh, quickly switched over to Signal and you're gonna see all sorts of campaigns um, doing the same thing now. But, you know, this is an ongoing arms race. Uh, there are always ways that governments are going to try um, to defeat these tools. Um, we have seen already four more leak prosecutions under the Trump administration, and you can bet that, that they will far surpass uh, the Obama administration's record. Uh, you know, they've only been in office 18 months. Uh, they are using even more sophisticated surveillance technology now. Uh, with the case of, of whistleblower reality winner, uh, there was um, invisible dots on the document that she's alleged to have leaked uh, that can actually identify her um, uh, via uh, what are called printer dots uh, that basically send out a unique signal every time somebody prints a document. Uh, the government has also, um, in another case, used uh, Freedom of Information Act requests to see documents that news organizations are trying to get and then going back and um, conducting surveillance on who may have accessed those documents. They have all sorts of very finite access controls uh, on you know, who accessed the document, when they accessed it, what they were doing with it. Uh, surveillance footage of all government employees. Gov government employees are essentially under total surveillance at this point. Uh, but you know, they haven't just targeted um, uh, government employees either. Uh, they have targeted journalists directly. Uh, this story just came out last month. Uh, the Trump administration had secretly seized the email records and phone call records of a New York Times reporter for a year's length of time. And again, these, just, these aren't just the uh, records that in, are involved in this particular leak case. This could potentially mean that dozens of sources from dozens of different stories uh, are now exposed. They also, you know, uh, so James Wolfe is uh, one of the sources, or one of the alleged sources, uh, in that leak investigation I just mentioned that had uh, brought in the New York Times. Uh, he was apparently, at least if you believe the government's indictment, using Signal. Um, and it, it shows you the limitations of even when you're using end-to-end -end encrypted messaging applications. Uh, the government actually got a hold of James Wolfe's phone and so they allegedly know the journalist that he was talking to. If you can use all the encryption and, and digital security protections in the world, but if someone has physical access to the phone of the person you're talking to, you may be out of luck. So, you know, that is, is encapsulates the state of journalism right now, but there are obviously many other uh, people who rely on First Amendment protections and 
would be concerned about increased government surveillance powers. Um, the next obvious case is protesters. Uh, they face many similar challenges that journalists do. So uh, here is a story about Chicago um, thinking about passing a surveillance bill that would allow surveillance drones to monitor protesters. Um, in uh, other countries, protesters are targeted with malware or viruses on their phone uh, without their knowledge so that governments can access uh, not only who they're talking to and where, but potentially what they're saying in those messages. Uh, there is a popular uh, facial recognition application in Russia right now, uh, which is being used to target protesters as well. Uh, the, somebody aims this facial recognition program uh, at, at anti-government demonstrators, then publishes their names and faces online, which then allows uh, government forces uh, to go after them. Uh, in Florida, uh, cops uh, have been using what are known as stingray devices uh, against protesters. Stingrays are a controversial tool that law enforcement is increasingly using. They're actually fake cell phone towers. So instead of going to the cell phone companies for uh, a whole trove of data, they rove around in a van with a fake cell phone tower and your phone covertly connects to it without your knowledge and they can suck all sorts of information uh, off of your phone. Obviously, this is not targeted at all. Uh, it can happen to anybody who is uh, in the surrounding area. Um, but at the same time, technology can be used to help protesters as well. Uh, this is a fire chat. It's an uh, app that was popular during a democracy protests in Hong Kong a couple years ago where uh, the internet was actually cut off from these protesters so they couldn't uh, communicate via normal means. Uh, but they, uh, this app actually uses Bluetooth uh, on your phone to create sort of a mesh network so you can actually communicate with people around you um, without using cell phone service or data. Um, there are all sorts of emergency phone apps out there now for protesters. So you can quickly alert your friends and family if you're worried about being arrested or you're about to be arrested, so they will know what happened to you and where you might be. Um, and, you know, if there's anybody interested in learning more about this, there are now um, uh, countless guides online um, for what you can, uh, what you should do and what you shouldn't do with your cell phone if you're going to an event uh, that may be politically charged and there may be a chance uh, of an arrest. Now, again, this is a game of cat and mouse. Um, you know, there's countries all over the world now who are blocking um, encrypted messaging apps completely uh, so that, you know, they can't see really uh, what people are saying on them. They, in, in some cases, they can't even see who's using them, but they know that they are being used and so they can block the IP addresses. Uh, that these applications use uh, to allow people to communicate. Um, you know, countries have known for um, almost a decade now how social media and um, encry now encrypted messaging apps can affect protests. Um, you know, encrypted messaging apps have responded by trying to circumvent these blocks. Uh, there was a technique uh, called domain fronting, um, which uh, was being used by Signal um, the app that I was mentioning earlier, uh, to circumvent uh, Egypt and Turkey and a bunch of other countries trying to block their app entirely. What they did was essentially disguise their internet traffic to make it look like it was coming from Google or Amazon. Um, unfortunately, Google and Amazon cut off uh, their ability to do this uh, last month uh, after another controversy in Russia where Russia tried to ban a popular encrypted messaging app. Um, but so that brings us to social media, um, which uh, virtually uh, everyone uh, in the United States uses in some form or another uh, at this point. And um, even when we're not talking about uh, protests where uh, people can get arrested um, or journalists who are having ultra-sensitive um, conversations that could put somebody's life on the line, uh, free speech principles um, are incredibly important. Um, you know, it's important to note that uh, social media companies uh, are not beholden uh, to First Amendment law. Uh, they are private companies, so uh, unless the government is ordering them uh, to censor something, they can actually choose what they want and what they don't want on their sites. 
And so that actually led uh, this quote from law professor Jeffrey Rosen, uh, who actually said this in 2010 and, and couldn't, be, uh, couldn't have been more prescient. You know, he said, Facebook has more power in determining who can speak and who can be heard around the globe than any Supreme Court justice, any king, or any president. And so over the years, social media companies have adopted stricter and stricter rules about what can and can't be said uh, on their sites. Uh, they have um, attempted to uh, ban um, different types of speech. Some, some in, in some cases, or a lot of cases, uh, their motives, um, a lot of people might th think, uh, are good. Um, but these can, wh whatever their motives are, uh, having a central authority, having uh, such power uh, over what we can and can't see online uh, has uh, potentially very negative consequences. So there are some hilarious consequences that happen uh, all the time. Uh, this was when um, Google was trying to ban the sale of guns and they accidentally uh, banned searches for Guns N' Roses in the movie Top Gun. Um, you know, you'll see these in the media quite frequently. Um, they will get fixed um, once the media draws attention to them, but who knows how many happen uh, without the media finding out. Um, but there's actually much more serious consequences. So uh, Facebook bans hate speech, and w which um, you know, most people can completely understand why. Uh, many people just don't want to see uh, deplorable and disgusting speech uh, when they sign on to look at pictures of their children or their grandchildren. Um, but uh, you know, in the um, attempt to clean up uh, the online space, these rules can actually have uh, a very negative effect on the actual people that they are trying to protect. So there have been uh, several prominent examples recently where um, activists were using, trying to use Facebook to call out hate speech, um, to alert people that specific uh, individuals were engaging in hate speech um, to criticize them. And uh, because of Facebook's algorithms and the fact that uh, they have two billion users and the human beings behind these, these uh, blocking decisions have three to five seconds to react to every case, uh, they end up uh, blocking an individual who is um, trying to call out this behavior. Uh, this happened uh, again to uh, another person uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, in Germany, where they actually have hate speech laws, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, hate speech is actually uh, protected um, speech under the First Amendment, but in Germany it's not. Uh, there was a, a recent case where uh, a German nationalist was called out on Facebook by an activist who called him a Nazi. Uh, this German nationalist actually won an injunction against this person to get this post banned uh, all over the world. And uh, so it's very clear that, that these laws can actually hurt the people that they are meant to help. And so we want to be able to think very carefully before we push these companies to ban another category of speech because they can often backfire. Uh, there was a, a quote at the end of this article that was my favorite. He had, the, the person accused of being a Nazi uh, had previously uh, accused the German government of seeking to censor online speech. Um, he then went and sought an injunction for Facebook for exactly that purpose. Um, so uh, another example, Google has uh, tried to ban extremist videos from YouTube. Another example of um, speech, deplorable speech, that is technically protected by the First Amendment, but Google uh, is not beholden to that. Um, you can understand why, uh, in some cases, Google would want to do this. But what happened was, uh, YouTube and Facebook started uh, removing actual evidence of war crimes. And there was war crimes prosecutors who were furious at these companies uh, for doing so. The activists had uploaded this, uh, these videos to Facebook and, and YouTube because there isn't a lot of internet infrastructure in war-torn countries. And they felt that was the safest place to put it. And so once YouTube decided to delete all these videos, um, there was no other copies. And war crimes prosecutors lost evidence uh, that they could use to actually prosecute the perpetrators of these crimes. Um, and the same can be said uh, about the fake news controversy. Um, you know, it's, you're not going to find many people who aren't against um, Facebook trying to get rid of 
stories that are made up out of whole cloth that are explicitly written to deceive people. But what ended up happening in the uh, hysteria after the election where so many people were pressuring these companies, uh, it ended up backfiring um, on a lot of the, the news organizations that it should have protected. Um, so progressive and left-leaning news sites that have been around for decades and have never been accused of engaging in, in fake news um, told the New York Times that their traffic uh, started to plummet, that they were not showing up in Google searches anymore, that people were not um, seeing their stories on Facebook. And Facebook and Google are how all news organizations now uh, drive traffic to their sites. Um, in another experiment, Google kicked off uh, every single news organization in five different countries uh, from its newsfeed section. Uh, all of these uh, companies um, saw their traffic, again, plummet. Um, and it's actually hurt mainstream outlets uh, in the United States uh, because Facebook um, wants to to move away from the controversy of fake news and uh, news completely, they are now prioritizing uh, what people see in their feeds um, from their family and friends and are, and are um, not sharing as many or, or not cropping up as many news stories in anybody's news feeds anymore. Um, and with Facebook, uh, you know, with 60% of the American public getting their news from Facebook, this has a huge, huge effect on uh, the news organization's bottom line. Um, so that, those are just kind of a few uh, different ways the technology interacts with First Amendment and free speech principles um, in, the, in the digital age. Um, and so a lot of that stuff is obviously um, quite scary and can be seen as negative, but so I guess I will end um, on a bit of good news. Um, I don't know if many of you saw, but actually just this morning, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in a 5-4 decision uh, that police are now required to get warrants um, and are required to comply with the Fourth, Fourth Amendment when they gather cell phone location data from your cell phone. Uh, this is one of the most important Supreme Court rulings on privacy in literally decades and will, um, without a doubt, um, strengthen all of our privacy rights, given that we all carry around a cell phone in our pockets close to 24 hours a day, and that cell phone can, if, um, in almost all cases, track our location. So with that, uh, I'm going to invite Andrew back out on stage, and we're going to have a little conversation. Trevor, thank you for that uh, fascinating, terrifying, Maybe a little uplifting at the end <laughs> presentation, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to continue this discussion because I want to include everyone in the audience to be part of it as well. And we're going to bring out two other panelists. Uh, our first panelist, her name is Stephanie Whited, and she has one of the best online profiles of anyone I've ever seen. You know how people like to put on their websites that they, all their accolades and their accomplishments and all the wonderful things they've ever done. Stephanie says two words directs communications. Part of that is a function of where she works. Uh, she's at the TOR network. TOR stands for the Onion Router. And it's a volunteer network that allows people to use the internet while masking where they are and what they're doing. And so you can imagine how that plays into First Amendment freedoms. Uh, Stephanie will explain more of that for us. Uh, she's also, in addition to that, she's an actor. So she was giving me some tips backstage about you know, how to present myself, how to be real out here. And uh, she's also a poet, and she lives in Brooklyn. So again, please join me in welcoming Stephanie. And our third and final panelist is David Green. David is one of the nation's leading uh, experts on the First Amendment. Uh, he's the Civil Liberties Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. That's another nonprofit in San Francisco, and it's focused on civil liberties in the, in the internet and in the digital age. And, uh, but in addition to that, he teaches at the University of San Francisco Law School. He uh, teaches the First Amendment there. He at one time ran a project that was called the First Amendment Project. Maybe we'll hear more about that. And uh, most notably, the uh, Northern California chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists recognized David with its uh, James Madison Freedom of Information Award for Legal Scholars. 
Please join me in welcoming Dave. It's really a, a killer panel, and I appreciate all of you making an effort to come to Pittsburgh and be part of this event. Um, Stephanie, I wonder if you could start out just by describing uh, the TOR project, what it is. Not a lot of people have heard of it uh, intentionally in the past, although I know part of your job <laughs> now is to let people know what it is. Right, we're trying to get the word out a bit more now. So the TOR project is a nonprofit based in Seattle. We have an international team of about 35 people, and we build software for privacy and freedom online. So we believe that everyone should have access to a free and open internet, be able to express themselves freely, access information, and do so privately. So the backbone of Tor software is the Tor network. It's a network of volunteer-run servers around the world, so there are about 6,000 right now. So when you use Tor software, your traffic is encrypted through three servers. It's encrypted at each layer, and each, each time it goes through this path, uh, it's another randomly selected path. So by the time you reach the, the website that you're going to, you, it's disconnected from, from, from you. So it's, it's separated from, um, from your identity. It's encrypted along the way. Um, the easiest way to use Tor is to use Tor Browser. Um, so I know that that, <laughs> listening to the network, it might sound a little complicated to use, but Tor Browser is a browser like other browsers. It's built by modifying Firefox. So using Tor Browser to browse the internet protects you from tracking, uh, surveillance, and censorship. So you've probably heard how Facebook and other trackers can build profiles of you when you're online. Uh, so if you use Tor Browser, it isolates each website you visit so they can't talk about you and build a profile on you. So all Tor users look the same. Um, and so you can, kind of, so you can stop um, stop being exploited on the internet, basically. That's what's happening to you. People are building profiles and um, uh, customizing things, uh, customizing your experience of the internet, but it's actually, uh, you're being exploited in that. Um, it can also protect against surveillance. So we've heard a lot of stories about how activists and journalists are surveilled. So if you're, if you're doing research for a story and you use Tor Browser, Someone who is monitoring, monitoring your connection is not going to know what you're doing. They're just going to know that you're using Tor, and so your activity is protected. Um, and this, you may not know this, or you may, may know it, but your ISP, your internet service provider, is legally allowed to track and sell what you're doing online. So using Tor is a way to prevent that from happening. I guess they will just sell that you're, that you're using Tor. Uh, the, the third part that Tor can help you with is uh, censorship. So this is something that is um, more valuable immediately in, in other parts of the world where the gov governments are blocking sometimes hundreds of websites, blocking access to social media. So it might be hard to imagine. So let's think about if all of the news that we could see about Trump was all Trump-sponsored news. What, what would that feel like to you every day? You can only see news that that Trump has sponsored. And you don't have access to social media, so you're not seeing differing opinions um, or critical analysis of what Trump is saying. That would be a very frightening world, and that's a world that a lot of people live in. So using Tor, if you use Tor browser in countries where, where websites and critical news are blocked, you can circumvent that censorship, and you can access blocked websites. Uh, Tor can also allow you to publish information with a high degree of privacy. Um, so if you're organizing a protest, you could create uh, what we call an onion site, and uh, that site would be very hard to take down. Uh, you could do that privately, so uh, it wouldn't be known who made the site, and people could visit it uh, without there being a record of, of who visited it. So there's a lot of opportunity and uh, ways that Tor can be valuable to help with First Amendment rights and, um, and do that around the world. So if I don't want my employer to know I'm watching cat videos all day. <laughs> exactly. And they, know, exactly. And they don't do something. <laughs> right. There are a lot of activists and journalists that, that use Tor, but really we're just talking about regular folks. What do you do on the internet every day? You look at several different news sites and you watch cat videos or whatever mm -hmm. you might do. So this is, this is what people do on the internet and this is what people use Tor for. Well, just so that everyone understands the context, uh, Trevor, you mentioned SecureDrop before. 
But you told me that's ba built on the Tor network. Yeah, platform, absolutely. So right? Secure Drop, uh, a key feature of it is the Tor browser, and so uh, sources to use Secure Drop actually have to. The only thing that they have to download or or, or have on their computer is the Tor browser to to visit um, over sixty major news organizations who have a Secure Drop. Okay, um, David, from your perspective, uh, we were listening to Trevor's presentation. Um, I know the two of you work closely together in San Francisco, and uh, in fact, uh, Trevor used to work at EFF, so uh, you have a, that connection. But Tor used to be at EFF also. Oh, okay. So there you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, how should people feel about this? Should we feel, um, you know, with all these things that he talked about, it, some, a lot of it was very um, threatening. So should we feel <laughs> bad about technology and, and what it means for the First Amendment, or should we feel liberated in some way? Well, I, I think one of the things I, I'd like that Trevor said was that there's a real duality to it here, that we get, we get costs and we get benefits with technology, you know, the same way we, we get with anything. And I think one of our, and so I hope people feel good about it, right? I hope we, we feel good about, we feel good about the benefits. And I think, and I, I think what we have to do is have to just be aware of the costs um, and, and, you know, and, and, and function that way. So I hope we actually feel good. I mean, technology has been, especially when you look at communications technology, has, has really been a, a tremendously beneficial thing in terms, of, in terms of people's ability to communicate with each other, right? And uh, even just, if you think about your own experience, right, about how easy it is now to keep in touch with people, um, that, that's great, and when you put that on a larger scale, right, in terms of people who, who were really remote before, who are remote from all of their friends and family, um, it, you know, it's our ability to stay in touch, communicate, to disseminate information to each other is, is really wonderful. You know, the, 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 the barriers to, um, you know, to, to be able to publish, um, not having to have the resources, either money resources or even just physical access to like a, a press, um, is, is really incredible, the amount of information we have. Now, of right. course, the cost to that is that there's, lot, there's no barrier anyone can publish, and so we're gonna get, we don't, have, we don't necessarily have an institution of trust behind everything that gets published, but that, and so we, we need to operate <coughs> in that system. Do you, so we've talked a lot about the freedom of the press, but the First Amendment says a lot more. Um, I, I wonder, Stephanie, if you could address the uh, freedom of assembly, because to me, that's one of the core functions of Tor, right? That it allows people to organize. We, we saw it with the, the uh, Arab Spring protest, right? That, that was, they were using Tor to get around government censors that might otherwise know where they were going. Uh, how does Tor fit into that, and how do you feel like technology has affected I assembly? Definitely keeping it open. I mean, in, it's kind of hard for us to imagine, but if, what would, the, what would it be like for us if Trump blocked Twitter? And Facebook, you know, we, there's a lot to complain about with Facebook, but in other parts of the world, that is one of the only ways to stay in touch, and governments do try to block it. So having a tool like Tor, uh, or something that allows you to circumvent censorship, can help you stay connected and have like, a, a public forum online, because it's definitely not going to be happening or in, in the streets, or it's, it's a lot more dangerous for that to happen in the streets. And so um, in order to build a, a constituency that is maybe going to go into the streets, and you have to have that space to, to organize it online. And the internet and tools can give us that. Right, so how does the tour, how does the tour network then allow that? You can, people can communicate without the government tracking it or police tracking it? Is that uh, right, I mean, uh, if someone is monitoring your network, then they know that you're using Tor, but they can't tell what you're doing. Or like where you're going or where you're planning to meet up. Right, or, okay. exactly. So um, your, your location is not revealed, your identity is not revealed. Um, and so it's less of kind of hiding, hiding these things and just not revealing it. So uh, the way we use the internet now is kind of like a surveillance capitalism. And so using Tor can, is disrupting that. You don't have to participate it, in it. Could you address that as well, David, the, the whole issue of assembly and, and how technology fits in with that? Yeah, well, it's uh, the communications technology, have a, it's, it's a great organizing platforms. Um, whether you're using Torx, you need to do it in secret, or whether you're just, you just need to organize, it's, it's, a, it's a really efficient way of trying to organize a, a group of people who may not know each other right. beforehand, who may have never you know, spoken or met beforehand, to rally around, to get to be in a physical place together, um, to organize, um, uh, you know, to organize a lettering campaign or an emailing campaign to their government, things like that. It's it's a really efficient way of doing that. 
Well, we saw it happen here yesterday with yeah. the, the protests at, up on Grant Street. Yeah, and much uh, of the protests are in the border also where, you know, those were uh, organized online and sort of spontaneously online, right? It wasn't some big organization saying, hey, this could be the protest. It was people who were concerned who sort of had this visceral reaction saying, I'm going to go there. We're going to do this. We're going to our ICE office and then that and then that happening around the country. But do you see the those kinds of restrictions that have existed in other countries then becoming a factor here in the United States then? You know, because not only are the protesters communicating, but the police are watching as well. Yeah. But they know what's happening. Yeah, and, well, and that's and then that's the flip side, right? And and Trevor touched on this is, is that um, at the same be when it does happen in the open, when you're not using tour, um, you also have to understand that people who don't want you protesting have are going to have easy access to that same information. If it's a government, they're going to have legal process behind that access that information, but it doesn't have to be a government. There could be lots of people. I mean, if something's public on Facebook, then pretty much anybody right. um, can see it. So um, so you, you have to be aware of, uh, and you have to understand there are tools that are available for when you for when you don't want to have that level of, of surveillance on you. Yeah. And I think I can bring it home a bit here that um, last year there's a, a website, I think it disrupted J20, um, and the Department of Justice wanted to know uh, the IP addresses and personal information about over a million people who had just visited this site. Yeah. And the purpose of this site was just to organize a protest on, on Trump's inauguration day. Um, and there's, there's, you're allowed to protest, you're allowed to, to visit <laughs> any website that you want, and uh, this is unheard of and scary. And uh, DreamHost uh, fought this, they challenged it, and they won, so they did not reveal the, the information of people who had visited this protest site, thankfully. Um, but if you had visited this site and you were using Tor Browser, your personal information would not be available. Um, and if that site had been created using Onion services, then no information on anyone who visited it would exist. Trevor, what about from your perspective? I know you mentioned a little bit during your presentation the issue of uh, protesters being tracked, but uh, are you, are you generally hopeful about the way this is going, that uh, you know, protesters and journalists are able to, to keep up with this technology, or, uh, or do you feel like the government's way ahead of it? I mean, you talked about it as an arms race. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it depends on what country you're in. Uh, luckily, okay. we do have the First Amendment in the United States, and so we don't have to worry about governments wholesale blocking uh, either social networks like Facebook or encrypted messaging apps like WhatsApp or Signal or Telegram, which we've seen in the news in the past six months has happened multiple times in multiple countries. Um, people uh, want to be able to use these apps uh, to communicate, and governments do have the ability um, to block them, uh, even, if they, even if there are some apps that they can't uh, have surveillance on. Um, so in you know, the US, where there are much different rules, um, you know, police and the authorities have taken a different tactic, that they are going to keep um, increased uh, surveillance on uh, people who are engaged in organizing some of these protests. Um, and that can be chilling. Uh, you know, if people uh, don't want to be, feel like that they're being watched, they might not show up to the protests to begin with. Uh, but the te technology has, as David um, was describing, it just provides an incredible ability um, for people to organize so much faster than they ever had before. Um, and so ultimately, I think it, it's um, absolutely a great thing. And we've seen it in the past 18 months, the, the protests that have sprung up all over the country. I mean, just at the very beginning of the Trump administration, how thousands and thousands of people, um, it, you know, within a couple hours, start showing up at airports. And, right. um, protesting the Muslim ban. Uh, that, that couldn't have happened, uh, not even probably 10 or 15 years ago. But I wonder if we're also, because of the First Amendment and, and because of our, our feeling, as Stephanie said, like, well, this, that can't happen in the United States. You know, we have this attitude, like, you, you can't do that. Um, when, they, when we see the government start to, uh, you know, pull gov uh, reporters' phone records and credit card records and all their information, uh, it's sort of like someone like, oh, I didn't think I needed to have that level of protection because I thought I was in the United States. I thought I had the First Amendment. I thought I didn't need to have all this technology on my side. Are we, at some sense, um, not adopting 
these technologies fast enough? Well, I, I think one a point, even yeah. preliminary to that to me, because even though we have these legal protections, doesn't mean the government just stops doing things. Right. I mean, where, yeah. where, the, where the legal protections come in handy is, is when the government does something and you can fight them off. I, I wish we were in a situation where the government just looked at the law and said, oh, we can't do that. Um, unfortunately, I think what we see fairly frequently is, uh, and, and this is not just, not just about the federal government, this happens at the state level, at the local level as well, and whether it's because people just wanna try and get away with as much as they can, or they just really don't understand what the, the limits of the law. Um, we see a lot of this stuff happening, it, they're just, hopefully there's some legal consequence. Um, uh, you know, no, it's funny you mention that because I was thinking, when you were making your presentation about um, the FBI going after reporters and whistleblowers, you know, part of me is back there thinking, well, you know, th th these people are patriots in, in a way, right? They're getting information out. Why, isn't there anyone in the FBI that's saying, well, or let's just let this go because, it's, you know, this is, they're doing what's better for the country. Um, do you, I mean, is that just, I suppose that's incredibly hey, uh, naive of me. Yeah, yeah. well, no, I, <laughs> um, I, you know, I never like to, you know, sort of guess what people's individual intentions <laughs> right. are. I don't know if anybody else wants to. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think it's probably a mix of both. I think there's, there's you know, uh, people quit jobs all the time if they have the luxury of being able to do so right. you know, because, the, because they don't like the direction it's taken. And I think that happens at that level as well. Yeah. Well, the, you know, going off of that point, you know, there is, um, you know, at least past administrations have been um, susceptible to public backlash. So when the, mm -hmm. the, the AP controversy uh, that I mentioned before and the Fox News controversy mm -hmm. where uh, the Obama administration Justice Department basically got caught spying on reporters, there was a huge public backlash at that point. And um, the Attorney General Eric Holder actually uh, tightened the internal rules in the Justice Department for when uh, the Justice Department could actually do this. Now, unfortunately, those internal guidelines um, don't, um, aren't the law. They are just internal guidelines. And so now we've seen uh, during the Trump administration that the, the Jeff Sessions has already said that he wants to revisit those guidelines. And in that case of the New York Times reporter where they got uh, a year's worth of her email and phone records, like if you read the guidelines, they clearly violate yeah. Um But there is no consequences for that. Um, so, you know, Eric Holder has, has talked about how that was one of his biggest mistakes. Unfortunately, during the Obama administration, they should have passed uh, a strong federal shield law into law, and so we, we might not be facing some of the problems that, that um, Trump is, is now um, really pouncing on. And, you know, and the other thing, just to, that ties in, is that when you have the unhappy FBI agent or the unhappy NSA employee, those are your leakers, right? Then yeah, they become right. yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, right, the people yeah, right. who, who, you know, who need secure drop, right? Do you, who I'm need Tor. Curious from Stephanie's perspective and the Tor project, are you seeing people using Tor more now that, uh, you know, that this kind of thing started happening with the, the Obama administration and with Trump? Uh, we've stayed pretty steady at about uh, two million users and we don't, cr we don't collect uh, really any more information than that. We don't, you know, we don't even know how many people are coming to our website uh, or, or visiting our blog. So it's entirely possible, but we have stayed uh, steady around 2 million users for uh, about a year at least. Okay. And you, you uh, have seen though, like encrypted messaging apps explode in popularity. Yeah. Um, Signal uh, said after, like just a few weeks after the election, that they already had four times as many users as they did. And, and I should clarify that if someone is, um, is using Onion Services, so um, creating a website with Onion Services, we don't have information on that and it's not tracked. So um, those could be used a lot more than we have any idea of. Um, so in addition to something like, uh, in addition to Secure Drop, Onion Services are also used for other platforms like Global Leaks, which is an anti-corruption reporting platform. So the Italian Anti-Corruption Authority just uh, set one of these up, um, so I don't think that, that that's not something that we can see in our, in our numbers. Do, because we are in Pittsburgh, I want to mention this uh, case with Carnegie Mellon University because there were these researchers who said they were able to break into Tor and figure out where people were coming in and out of the networks, who they were, um, and then the FBI shut it down and said, no, you can't talk about this. Uh, I'm just curious, could you talk a little bit about how secure the network is and whether you you know, is there a back door? Is there a way for people to see? What's well, they, going on? they did find a vulnerability that was patched. Um, but in the Snowden leaks, it was revealed that the NSA had not cracked Tor. Oh. So we. They were um, very frustrated. <laughs> <in fact. laughs> right. um, so the Tor network is secure. This is what 
um, you know, we have a team working on a lot of security researchers and develop, developers help us keep Tor strong by looking for bugs and finding it and trying to break it. Um, and so this is something that never ends. The development isn't just done at some point. We're always trying to keep up with um, new threats and new ways that people could be revealed and continuing to make Tor strong. So from my, from my Pittsburgh-centric view of the world, all I heard you say was CMU is more powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to add something? Here? No, I just wanted to say I don't know if people are aware, um, but when Stephanie talks about sort of having using an having using having an onion site and thing, a dot onion site and everything, um, which which is it's a one it's a great thing. It's a it's an incredibly democratizing tool, both in this country and globally and everything. But people on the other side who don't like the ability to have sort of secret sites that, that people can have will pejoratively call this you know, the dark web. And so when mm -hmm. you hear these awful things about the dark web, what we're talking about is this really rights protective space that, <laughs> right. that exists. Now, you know, people might use it to do illegal things as well. But when you hear this term, the dark web, you know, that makes it sound so awful and it's, it's wrong with criminals, what it, this is what we're, they're talking about. Right. It's actually the privacy and security that we should be demanding online right now. Um, and it's, it's not scary. Kind of what we're seeing right now with the dark web is what happened at the beginning of the internet. There was a huge cyber panic. All of the stories about the internet were about how awful it was and how they just was only criminals on there. So it's the kind of thing that we're seeing with the dark web now. But there is that duality though, right? Where you create a, a, a site that's secure so that people can communicate and people can evade government censors. But then that on the other side also gives rise to something like the Silk Road, you know, an online drug website that um, you know, people were able to freely buy uh, illicit drugs on there because it's also free from government censors. It's true. So uh, we develop free and open source software and anyone can use it. And we can't develop that software for also dictating who gets to use it um, and creating what would essentially be a back door to decide what gets taken down and what doesn't would put our most vulnerable users at risk. So well, and to, you know, because there's been so much negativity over the last couple of days, right, on this point. On that point, the, the U.S. government actually funds TOR to help create a system that allows people to avoid the U.S. government, right? So. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Part of the U.S. government does, uh, does fund us. We're, um, we're transparent with, uh, with our financials. We haven't yet released our, our latest report, but I think we're about maybe at 50% government funding now. And, we're also funded by the National Science Foundation, Open Technology Fund, um, Mozilla, the Rose Foundation, and tens and thousands of, of individuals. But um, right, some parts of the government maybe like us more than other parts. Yeah. <laughs> so, I do, in a few moments, I'm gonna open the discussion to the room because I want us to really have a discussion with everyone here. But uh, you know, the one place that we haven't really talked too much about uh, yesterday or today, and I, and I wonder if you could address it, David, as a First Amendment scholar, is the freedom of religion. And, uh, you know, where does freedom of religion fit into this whole broader discussion, but then also with the technology issue? Oh, that's a good question. I wasn't prepared for that one. Um, do, uh, do you think about it much? I mean, is it, you know, the, when people talk about the, the freedoms, I mean, that's definitely part of it, right? And, and it's this whole idea that we have as Americans that we can gather wherever we want, we can print and say whatever we want, and yeah. part of it is we can practice our religion, right? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, to the extent that, you know, technology and communications technology is useful for people communicating and gathering, I mean, they can certainly do so to, to express their religious views, to, or express dissident religious views, you know, to gather and find other people to who they want to, who they share those views with. So it's going to help like that, that at all. You know, we haven't really seen sort of a, we haven't really seen a conflict in the courts with um, sort of technology specific you know, speech issues and, and religion issues. There's lots of conflict between speech and religion, religion issues all the time. Um, but we haven't really seen one that's sort of technology specific. It'd be interesting to, interesting yeah. to keep our eyes open for. Well, I think that's one of those things that is different about the United States versus some other parts of the world, right? Where maybe you do need technology to practice your religion if you're in China and you're Falun Gong or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's certainly right. you know some some countries are you know, don't have religious freedoms, and and so and again, this is something where they're going to need to be doing it with a with a level of security, um, and secrecy, as well. So I, one thing I wanted to mention about because uh, both you know we have a lot today here, and and, and Yasha talked about it, it's come with some of the other panels is sort of 
you know, we, we talk about sort of international uh, uh, impacts a lot. And I, I want to make, I want people to understand that the reason um, it's really important to always have an international perspective whenever even you're talking about sort of U.S. speech and U.S. technology policy is for two reasons. I mean, the, whatever we do in this country, whatever law or whatever policy we enact has this really huge outsized influence outside the world when it comes to both speech and technology. And when it's speech technology, it's even, it's even larger. So we have a reputation around the world for having, um, for being very, having a legal system that's very protective of free speech. Whenever we put even the smallest, um, you know, the smallest restriction on speech, you know, that is giving other nations um, you know, permission to, to do something 10 times larger. And, because, and with technology, it's the same thing. Because the internet developed in this country and because the early law around the internet was all US law, anything that we do policy-wise and legally in this country about the internet is magnified 100 times in other countries. And that's just why we need to be really, really careful when even if we're saying, well, you know, we've decided there's this balancing and maybe the speech is harmful, so we're not going to allow it. That's like, a, that, might, that might be acceptable here. We might be able to live with it here, and it has drastic effects in other, in other parts Although, of the world. Lately, we've been seeing it from the EU as well, right? Because the, as consumers, at least, we're seeing all these restrictions on uh, the internet and social media in, in Europe and how that's affecting us. Trevor, can you? Yeah, I mean, there's a great example of, of what David was just saying um, uh, about uh, fake news. So when the fake news controversy started around the time of uh, the 2016 election, Facebook saw a giant spike in dictators all around the world demanding Facebook t t take down all sorts of different posts mm. claiming that they were fake news. Right. Um, and so even if we are trying to solve something that we think is a legitimate problem, it can have huge negative consequences globally. Um, and it's something that we not, might not be thinking of in the heat of the moment, um, but it, it's a perfect example of how authoritarian governments jump on these issues as soon as they see them. Well, I think that was one of the fascinating parts of your discussion was you, know, you, you do one thing thinking you're doing a good thing and then it, it turns out that it's a, a slippery slope and has all these unintended consequences. So. Yeah. And, and I think with, uh, with fake news especially, I mean, it, there's this really great effort in this country and in other sort of liberal democracies, you know, to try and rank, new, new, to give people media literacy tools so they can, you know, they can make judgments about what's reliable and what's, and what's not. But that doesn't always translate to the way internet is used in other parts of the world. And so, for example, you know, typically a, a, a story without a byline you know, will be will be graded down because that's not that sort of doesn't have the you know indicators of reliability that we would look for in a news story. But there's some people who don't have the ability to put their names on what they write because it will put their lives at risk. Um, and they, re they rely on Facebook to get their news out of their country because Facebook's one of the few sites that's not blocked in their countries, like much more than, you know, than you know, we, you know, uh, any of us do. Right. Um, and so the idea that, that we could institutionalize sort of ranking as something that's going to be determinative actually has this, we have to be really careful about that. Yeah, there's, a, uh, you know, there's you know, stats that say 60% of Americans get news from Facebook. In other countries, Facebook is the internet. When they talk mm. about the internet, they're talking about logging on to Facebook. So it's in, in some parts of the world, it's really all or nothing. Wow. Um, let's take a question from the audience. I guess we're not using the microphone, so just shout it out. <laughs> Well, that would certainly be, be horrible. Um, I think that we need to separate the tools from the crimes here. If we got rid of TOR, I don't think it, these crimes would be prevented. They 
they've existed before Tor, they've existed before the internet. So uh, instead, if we're removing these, we're removing freedom of speech for millions of people around the world. And so it's not really um, an option. I think that you know, finding out that things like this are happening are still done uh, the old-fashioned way, um, investigating um, and finding and finding people. Um, so I don't think that getting rid of the technology is a solution. And in fact, the technology could help find people that are trying to orchestrate things like this. Um, and without the technology, there would maybe be less evidence that that these things are happening. This is part of that duality we talk about, right? Like after the Patriot Act, after 9/11, and you know. People were so afraid they were willing to give up their freedoms. Um, David, do you have any thought on that, or like how do you? Well, yeah, that? I mean that's you know whenever you're going to have, I, I think it's impossible to have a tool that that offers people to, that offers people this really this privacy protection um, and allows them to exercise their right, max, really try and maximize exercise their rights, but only allow the people who are doing good things to use it. It's just, <laughs> uh, and and, and I, I don't mean that flippantly. No, it's no, just yeah, that's, right, yeah. And that's I, that's the way. It is. And so we're always. We're going to have that. We're, we've had people who do bad things, you know, before TikTok. We'll have them after. It's a, it's going to, it's always going to be a problem. Um, and you know, I, I think one of the fortunate things about sort of the golden age of communications is that law enforcement actually has you know has a ton of of ways of a lot more ways of getting information, many more than I think I'm as a civil liberties lawyer actually comfortable right, with. Yeah. But they're there. So we're going to have that. We're, we're always going to. We can't. We, we can't. We, we're never going to have something that's only going to be used for great purposes and never going to be used for evil purposes. The other, the other yeah. thing is that um, you know encryption and digital security tools actually prevent a lot of crime. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily a battle over having uh, privacy versus uh, national security. Um, so a couple examples, you know, um, when there's been a controversy over uh, Apple uh, encrypting by default everybody's cell phone. Um, but when they actually made that decision, um, the number one crime in New York City is stolen cell phones and robberies and, and involving yeah. stolen cell phones. Um, and because uh, criminals could no longer get into people's phones, uh, the, that the crime, crime dropped down. Plummeted. Yeah. Um, and you know you can see it uh, you know every day in the newspaper um, about uh, all of these um, major companies who uh, get hacked. Um, people have their email hacked all the time, um, and when there are these giant deposit depositories of, of or repositories of information, where companies keep millions and millions and millions of people's very personal data. Um, a lot can go wrong in that situation. And so if we have a more end-to-end -end encrypted world uh, where only you have access to your data and not all of these companies with lax security practices, um, you know, the protections for you who are worried about criminals actually goes up. There's a question over here. Does anything get removed from Tor? Um, I don't understand exactly what, what picture that you're saying, but if, if someone has, um, so in order to create an Onion site, you have to have a host, and then you configure a site using Tor. Um, if there is, we, we don't get notifications when there is new content. If we do hear about something, um, there are no back doors. No, we don't, we don't take anything down. Um, so if there's child porn on there, you can't? You can't block no, it or no. Take it down. I mean, it's yeah. disgusting and vile. And again, this is this would still exist without Tor. It also exists on the clear web. It also exists on the internet. Is the answer to shut down the internet? I don't think it is. Um, maybe you disagree. No. So if we created a back door, that would allow anyone to. That would put everyone at risk that's using Tor. So our most vulnerable users, activists, journalists, people around the world, um, everyone would be susceptible to attacks if we did that. So this is really, which really gets to the heart of the First Amendment, right? That if we believe right. in the First Amendment, we believe in the First Amendment, even when we disagree with the speech. Um, it's still there, right? I mean, is that oftentimes, oftentimes, you know, so Tor can't take down these sites. 
uh, oftentimes they do get taken down when there's police investigations uh, into various legal sites like the drug, the drug site right. that you mentioned earlier, uh, Silk Road. Um, so police can use normal investigative techniques. People who make these sites uh, often, um, almost in all cases, will slip up and post some identifying information about them. And so police can use old fashioned investigative work to figure out who they are. So when they uh, found the person who was uh, running that drug market, um, he was arrested and they were they are able to take down the site because the servers are sitting in that yeah. person's living room. Right. Um, it's just that, that, that Tor itself can't pick and choose which sites to take right. down. Um, when uh, uh, law enforcement authorities find where the physical servers are that are hosting um, that type of illegal content, they can take Yeah, and, and the good news is that when sites like that become really popular, like Silk Road yeah. did, and there was a child um, pornography site called Playpen that became extremely popular, it actually becomes very, those things don't stay a secret for very long. Um, and, and, and law enforcement is able to find who's doing it. I mean, Tor doesn't, still doesn't have the ability to do it. They can't build their system so that they have the ability to do things like that because it would make the whole system insecure. But um, when the things actually become sort of effective as a way of evading law, they actually it becomes hard to keep them secret just because people talk about it. So. Is there anyone on this side of the room? Yeah, here. So if we get supercomputers that can mm -hmm. correct, tore open, and it gets back to your, the whole issue of the, the arms race too. Like you're, right, you're, I you're suppose like, it's possible. We're always trying to keep up with the latest developments and keep Tor strong. Uh, we have um, someone on our team or maybe multiple people working on quantum computing and a lot of new developments. So we're, we're committed to keeping Tor strong as long as it's needed and it looks like we'll be around for a while. <laughs> if there are uh, quantum computers that can suddenly break Tor, we'll actually have much bigger problems because everybody's bank accounts will be vulnerable as well. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and you know, cybersecurity experts will tell you that this is, there's, you're, you're, it's, you're, you're, never, you're never finished. Right, you're always, it's, you, you create something, you put it out there, someone discovers, a, a researcher discovers a vulnerability and you fix it. And that's, that is an everlasting process. You're, you're making something, uh, someone discovers a vulnerability, hopefully it doesn't get exploited and, and you can fix it. And that's how it works. And that's why giving cybersecurity researchers, who sometimes are pejoratively called hackers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of the freedom to do their work is a really important thing for all of our security. Yeah, oftentimes people think of security as a binary. You're either secure or not secure, but in fact, um, it's, it's really a progression. You know, we try to help journalists get more secure uh, instead of less secure. Um, and we're never going to be able to claim to them that um, you are 100% protected no matter what you do. But you try to make the attacker's job uh, a bit harder. Um, if you're worried about criminals, um, if you make the job harder on them, they will probably go and try to find somebody else. Um, if you're worried about governments, uh, making it harder on them eliminates uh, a lot of the mass surveillance that we've seen in the news for the past few years. Uh, if it's very easy to conduct surveillance, governments can vacuum up information on hundreds of millions of people. Um, but if, if we're all using end-to-end -end encrypted communications and anonymity tools, they will only focus their efforts on the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. um, and so it makes, um, you know, to your point over there, it makes, uh, you know, society collectively safer uh, while allowing them to focus on the truly bad guys. Are there, based on what all of you know about the internet and security, are there some basic things you do in your personal lives that you mm -hmm. tell your spouses or children or friends, like, hey, you should be doing these things? Just, I mean, the things that would be useful for people in the audience. Who wants to go first? Oh, I, use, <laughs> um, I use Tor Browser for most of my activity online. I also use a Just pass, for everything. 
I use a password oh, for everything, for most you? things. Yeah. I can't, I okay. can't watch Netflix in, in Tor browser, okay. but right. okay. um, for most things. Um, I use a password manager that helps me generate and store very secure passwords that I don't have to remember. So, I mean, I have quite a pretty big database of that now, and it's going to help me not be uh, vulnerable in the, in the future. So that's a really, really big one. If you don't have a password manager, that's a great place to start. Is there, uh, are there any sites that you recommend for that, password managers? Um, <laughs> there are several. I, got the, okay. I don't know which are the best. I'm not an expert on the yeah, password not to manager. Advertise or advertise. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, so sometimes, it, especially a few years ago, um, using security and encryption tools can sometimes make your life more difficult. Um, but they are getting easier and easier. Um, Signal, which I've mentioned a few times, is just an app on your phone. It works like iMessage. Um, and as long as the people you're communicating with also have it, um, it's, it's just like a normal cell phone call or a normal text message, but much more secure. Uh, the, uh, a password manager is a great um, recommendation for anybody uh, because not only does it make um, you far more secure, but it ends up making your life a lot easier. Everybody now has to log into dozens and dozens of sites yeah. on websites, and if you are um, even trying to rotate your passwords or use a few um, for a few different sites, you quickly start forgetting them, you start making them easier to remember, you start using the same password for each site. With the password manager, you have to remember one password for the password manager, and then you don't have to remember any other passwords. Mm. So you can just copy paste into all these different sites. You'll ha they'll be you know really long, really random, and you can save your brain space for something else. So that's super useful. All right, do you have anything? I mean, you, those things. Yes. Um, I also try to uh, minimize the number of other people's computers that are in my house. Okay. So that means I don't we don't I don't have like a smart house. I don't have Internet of Things things. Um, and um, because those would be access points to your house, is that what you're Yeah, saying? those yeah. are putting other people's computers in my house, yeah. um, in which they control. Um, and uh, and the other thing, I mean, I, you know, I have two teenagers as well who but you go to their schools. They have, you know, they're required to use um, you know, sort of third party technology stuff. And, and so we, we talk a lot about how they do their settings when they're signed in. You know, they should only be they're only signed in when they're doing their schoolwork. They need to sign out and use completely other things when they're doing personal mm -hmm. stuff, because the idea that you know, first of all their school might have access to their browsing history if they do it on you know through their their G their G, G Suite for education or whatever you know thing. Mm -hmm. you're, School is using, um, and you know, and also then it's also just in a you know in a central place, and we talk about what are the benefits between being signed into Google and searching, and and what are the risks involved when you do that as well, and so you know I I, I don't don't follow them that closely to know what they actually do, but at least we talk we and we have to, we try and be, you know, talk about how do you actually use technology as a student, um, you know, and how do you separate your student life, which your school gets to see a lot of from. The stuff you want, you just make sure you don't let your school or your parents. I think just having that discussion with your children is so important. I, I know for myself when I was covering cybersecurity and I, I thought I had everything locked down, and then my son came to me at like 11 o'clock at night. He's like, Dad, he had ransomware that he downloaded. And I was like, Oh, I didn't think about my son. <laughs> like, no, no. Um, <laughs> one thing that came out of my lunch today was uh, when I was having lunch, and everybody was saying, you know, these some of these panels can be very discouraging. Um, and so I wanted to end. And the suggestion was we've got to and every panel on something positive. So I want to ask you, uh, what gives you hope? You know, so what, what's one thing that, of all this, gives you hope for the, the future and technology with the First Amendment? Trevor, you want to go first? Well, I had previously mentioned that there was a, a really great Supreme Court ruling today uh, where uh, the Supreme Court essentially said that um, police now need a warrant uh, to get the cell phone location on your, on your phone. Um, and this is a huge ruling that will affect countless people throughout the U.S. Um, for years and years, the uh, police have uh, at least claimed that they could do this without complying with the Fourth Amendment. And so starting today, they can't. Uh, but it, on the larger end of things, you know, we often hear about privacy violations in the news all the time. Um, there is an argument that our privacy rights are getting better as a whole. Um, a couple years ago, the Supreme Court had a, a, another really important ruling which said that the police could not actually seize your physical cell phone and look in it without also getting a warrant. That affects over uh, 12 million people a year. Um, the, after the Snowden revelations, Congress passed what was uh, fairly modest but still 
uh, reform uh, towards intelligence agencies, made them a little bit more accountable, a little bit more transparent. There are still a hundred different problems with what they do, uh, but it was a positive step forward. Um, state, you know, even though Congress right now is basically dysfunctional, states have started taking the lead on passing net neutrality legislation. Uh, they have taken the lead on uh, other privacy legislation uh, that can go a long way um, in improving people's rights. So it's, even though we read headlines about how it's all bad news and it's important to read those headlines, mm -hmm. understand what is going on, uh, there is still uh, a lot of good news. It just takes a little while. <laughs> all right, so that makes us perfect. Stephanie, quickly, any? Um, I think it's incredibly inspiring how people don't stop fighting when the internet is blocked. They find tools that keep getting online and keep finding ways to connect with each other. So I think if things do uh, turn for the worse here, we will find ways to stay together and stay connected. And that's what that's what humans do. That was awesome, like a call to the streets. I like that. <laughs> David, what do you got? Yeah, no, I, I think it's uh, it's to me it's really encouraging um, how how much the internet and communications technology in general has really brought democracy a lot closer to the people. And just picking up on a lot of the other speakers today have said how, you know, how easy it is to, to contact your representative um, when you're unhappy or something or to organize people around an issue, I think is something that we should all be really happy about and we should, we should make sure that we, still, we always have that right to do that. All right, this might, might get us into the weekend, so thank you for anything. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks for the time.